there that's uh, that's distracting, um, and even the the common loon at the top with the drops of water beaded up on its head. Um, it's nice to sort of give you the sense of action and and immediacy of that that moment, um, but in the context of a field guide, in the extreme, someone could actually look at that and say, oh the Winter plumage common loon has drops of water on its head, and the yellow bill doesn't. Um, that's kind of an extreme example, but it it could happen, and lots of other more subtle things do happen. Um, the the field guide illustrations really need to be um, standardized and generalized, almost uh, well to the extent that um, they don't represent an individual bird at all, um, but the the species. So these are the kinds of illustrations I ended up doing in, in the end for the bird guide. They're much simpler than those loon images. The, the, just a few brush strokes, just a suggestion of feathers and feather patterns. Um, doing away with as much of the fine detail as possible to, to emphasize the, the shapes, the broad patterns of color, the things that are really useful for identifying these birds at a distance. Um, and I think that uh, um, this sort of gets at one of the questions I often hear is whether I think photographs or paintings are a better uh, medium to illustrate a field guide. And obviously, um, I've made my investment in paintings. <laughs> that's where I that's where I think the best uh, field guide illustrations are. But it, it's for that reason that the, the photograph really illustrates one individual bird at one moment in time with one, one set of uh, um, camera settings, one exposure, one uh, lens. It, it's a very specific instant that's represented there in that picture. In these illustrations, I can show what I think is the average bird or the average tree, which I'll get to in a minute, um, and make all of them uh, comparable, all in the same pose. Um, another thing that I think this, uh, this kind of illustration does is um, almost leave you... Um, it, it sort of uh, leaves you wanting more. It's... Um, it shows you how to identify the birds, but it really doesn't show you. Uh, it, it's not conveying um, a uh, an experience or a um, a scene in the field. So you can use these illustrations to identify these species, whether you see them in the rain or in bright sunlight or in fog in summer or winter, um, at sunset or in the middle of the day. These illustrations will work. But it's up to you to go out and kind of fill in all those experiences for yourself. Um, I think the simplicity of the illustrations leaves a lot for the viewer to fill in, for the for the reader to add. So uh, it uh, it's kind of uh, encouraging all of you to go out and actually find the birds for yourselves to see what all the details are that I left out of these pictures. Um, here's a close-up of one of those grebes to show, again, how, how simplified it is. Um, now, when I, to me, the field guide is not just a collection of individual illustrations. The illustrations are, are part of it to show the, the pattern, or to show the, the distinguishing features of one, um, one bird, one species. Um, but I wanted to show also the the patterns of variation within each species. So here, as a page in the bird guide, you see the um, two species of grebes and the whole range of plumage variation in each. Um, and also the whole pattern of variation across all the species of birds. Um, the uh, um, When we classify things, put names on them, we're really trying to understand the whole system. And uh, I want to, I think the field guide should be there to help you understand the whole system of, of birds, trees, nature. Um, 
so after I finished the bird guide, I, I wanted to do, uh, um, well, I, I worked on several different things for about a year, half a year, and then I was thinking I wanted to do another big project. Um, I wanted something else I could really sink my teeth into for many years, a big project of classifying some whole group of, of uh, things. And I searched around for different ideas, different topics I could cover. Um, and trees came right to the front of that list. First of all, for because I was seeing trees every single day. And for this kind of project, I wanted to work with something that I was able to see all the time, that I was able to live with and see in summer, winter, sunrise, sunset, um, in the fog, in the snow, uh, to be able to see the whole range of, of uh, views of these um, things. Um, and then try to summarize that to, to make a, a sort of average or composite view of those species. So trees being the thing that I was seeing all day, every day, much more so than butterflies or salamanders or some of the other things I considered, um, they came right to the top of the list. Um, and I thought that there was an opportunity to create a tree field guide that would um, work on some of the same methods that the bird field guide does, which is basically as a, a visual catalog. Um, modern bird guides work um, where you, you go out in the field, you see a bird, you try to take note of a few distinguishing features, and then you flip through the pages of the book looking for a picture that matches. Um, our brains are very good at, at that kind of pattern recognition, and it works because over time, after you flip through the pages a few times, you develop uh, a sort of um, sense in your mind of the patterns through the pages of the book. You know that in the middle of the tree book, um, there are about 40 pages of oaks. <laughs> and after you get a little more familiar with that, you might know that the tree you're trying to look up isn't an oak, so you can skip that whole 40 pages in the middle of the book and move on to other sections. Um, so just by the process of flipping through the book a few times, trying to look things up, you'll start to understand subconsciously the patterns of variation, the whole system. Um, and that was the kind of uh, tree guide that I wanted to uh, create. So. Um, I started looking at trees and, and discovering that there are um, really distinctive uh, differences between species. Um, in this picture, there's a um, gray birch in the middle, and on either side, um, the twigs of quaking aspen. These are two species that are common in the Northeast um, and superficially similar, especially in winter, when they both have pale bark with dark marks. Um, and they're both fairly small trees. But if you look at the, the structure of the twigs, they're very different. Um, the gray birch has very slender twigs. They curve gracefully. Um, there's lots of them, lots of fine twigs up in the crown. The quaking aspen has much stiffer looking stout twigs. They look sort of awkward and um, uh, um, rugged. And they're, they're stout, there aren't as many twigs, it's a sparser crown. So at a glance, if you notice the bark and you look up at the twigs, you can identify these, these two species of trees. And the best part is that these differences hold true across all the related species. So all the birches have um, fairly dense, slender twigs. And all of the poplars, cottonwoods, um, aspens um, that are all in the same genus all have these stiff, stout twigs. Um, so that's the kind of difference that I think has been overlooked in, in tree guides before, um, which focus much more on the um, very small details. Um, and uh, I wanted to do a, more of a field guide to the whole tree. Um, one of the other things I, I discovered when I started